Welcome everyone to the Transport and Mobility Workshop that we're holding as part of doing version two of the Robotics Roadmap for Australia. My name is Sue Kay and I'm the Research Director for Cyber Physical Systems with CSIRO's Data61 and was one of the architects of Australia's first version of the Robotics Roadmap, which we released in mid-2018. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all meeting today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. As many of you will be aware, we've moved to holding virtual workshops. So there are people in all different parts of the country uh, and that's just because uh, of the current COVID-19 situation. Um, this is just a reminder that this was the original roadmap that we released in 2018 and the aim of today's workshop is really to build off what we did in 2018 uh, and in particular one of the criticisms that was raised of this first roadmap was that we really only had a very small section around self-driving cars. And clearly everyone thinks self-driving cars are likely to change the world in which we live. And it would be good to have a, a perspective on what it is that Australia can contribute into this area and more broadly in terms of transport and mobility. So while Australia may not have a, um, a, a vehicle, a, you know, a car manufacturing industry of our own, uh, we certainly have a number of examples of companies that are developing the types of technologies that can be used in self-driving car supply chains. So I think there are a lot of opportunities in this space and certainly if we look more broadly than self-driving cars at transport and mobility, there will be a lot of areas where we can contribute. So part of the idea of holding this workshop and introducing a chapter on transport and mobility to this new version of the roadmap is to try and capture what those opportunities are. In the first version of the roadmap, we put forward 18 recommendations for things that would be useful for Australia to consider uh, that would help us to really create a sustainable robotics industry here. And <clears throat> one of the recommendations for industry was around how we can get investment into Australia, reskill Australian workers, and also form new high-tech firms. And this is where I think our involvement in transport and mobility is going to be quite critical because to maintain sovereign supply chain capability and to actually be building some of the tech that we need to use for transport and mobility and to be able to have the conditions where we can do that here in Australia is becoming increasingly important. As part of doing the first roadmap, we undertook a capability mapping exercise where we looked at not just robotics, but robotics related technologies such as sensor systems, vision systems, to have a look at uh, what companies were doing in different parts of Australia. And what we found were that, you know, there are more than a thousand companies that have a capability in developing robotics or robotics related technology and that really a lot of these could potentially be applied to the transport and mobility sector. And I guess these are the sort of stories that we're hoping to unearth as part of doing version two of the roadmap and which we will hear some examples from our presenters today. So the idea of doing version two is to keep the momentum going from the first roadmap where I think we really raised the profile of robotics in Australia to help encourage the skills development that we need to have a sustainable robotics industry, to identify where Australia can make a difference, to keep unearthing capability, because I'm sure there is a lot out there that we are not familiar with, and ultimately to establish a clearly recognised robotics industry in this country. And as we've had to move to virtual format, we're sensitive that that makes it more difficult for people to have their say. So we have got a, an online survey, which is also accessible through the Robotics Australia network, where we encourage you to give us some input uh, into the roadmap. And we will keep uh, looking back at that survey and using it to help inform the content of the second version of the roadmap. So today there's been a slight change to the agenda that has been previously circulated. 
So our presentation from Brett Dale from um, Motor Traders Association Queensland, unfortunately, we will do the activity associated with Brett's presentation, but Brett is unable to attend today because of a family um, emergency and sends his apologies. Um, and so we will probably finish a little bit early, but we will still be doing an activity around the topic that Brett was going to be speaking about. But I'd like to thank my co-chairs in putting all of this together, Michael Milford from QUT, Brett Dale from Motor Traders Association Queensland, Zoe Ether from My Smart Community, Paul Lucy from Project 412, Ian Christensen from iMove CRC, and um, I didn't list him here, but Andrew Scott has been very busy setting up all of the Miro boards to encourage people to have their say. So um, welcome again to the workshop and I hope you uh, enjoy the workshop and can participate as much as possible. I'm now going to hand over to our first presenter, Michael Milford. Thanks, Michael. Andrew, are you doing a Miro introduction first or oh, not? I'm sorry, I didn't even follow my own agenda. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to hand over to Andrew, who, Andrew Scott, who is from Queensland Robotics Cluster and who has been our Miro master and will guide us through how we're going to be running the activities today. Thank you, Thank you Michael. Um, so just uh, in way of introduction, so we want this to be an interactive session and we want to try and capture as much content as we possibly can. So I'm just going to orientate you to uh, to Miro and what it's all about. It's basically a, a uh, online collaboration environment. So think of it as like the uh, the sticky wall, the 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 brown paper walls that you would normally do a workshop type activities in. So I'll just orientate you to some of the key tools. So on the left hand side, uh, there is actually a toolbar. There's a pointer, uh, and the, probably the the most useful tool is the sticky note tool. So you can click on the sticky note. Choose your favourite colour, uh, place uh, the sticky note on. You can change the size of your sticky note, small, medium, large, um, and then you can put down your ideas or your, your comments. Now, one thing, you, it, uh, like a trick for young players, is that uh, it will remember the last action that you did. So once you've placed the sticky note, you can just double click uh, and it will remember the last action. If you don't want someone moving your sticky note, you can actually lock it into place. Um, and then I'll, I'll just uh, sort of look at uh, some of the other tools we've got here. So we've got a section that we'll do uh, later, uh, which is the brain uh, mind mapping tool. So this is sort of a brain, uh, a, um, uh, sorry, a, um, a brainstorming tool. Um, and so the idea of this tool is to, uh, to actually uh, click on where you see type something. And if you want to extend the branches, you just click on the plus um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, do that. Now, as we speak, or as we hear from our speakers, sorry, I've got a, a page for each of the speakers and they've placed some questions on there. So while you're listening to Michael, for example, uh, you can actually go and have a look at the questions that he's posed or the comments that he's posed uh, and you can respond to that. Uh, and then we're going to have some time uh, after each speaker to sort of have a more focused look on that. So for each of the, and including Brett, so the activity that uh, Sue mentioned is that we're going to uh, spend some time answering the questions that, uh, that Brett posed uh, to this group. Uh, and then um, the other activities or the other boards that I want to sort of bring you to attention is that we do have a summary of the, the, um, the version one up the, the top um, right hand, uh, left hand corner. And there is also a link uh, for your convenience uh, to the survey at the bottom of that. Um, the other uh, board that if we get time uh, throughout is to uh, have a look at, uh, see if we can get your input on the technology roadmap. So this is a, a consistent tool we've used in all of the workshops to try and articulate what technologies are available now, uh, what are being worked on and we think we're, are going to be available in 5, 15 and 30 year time frame. And then up the top is a, a bit of a SWOT uh, TOS uh, analysis and it's really sort of uh, getting your feedback on what are some of the political factors uh, that face us here in Australia. Uh, and maybe even broader. Uh, what are some of the, the cultural uh, aspects? Uh, what are some of the economic factors? And what are some of the social factors? Uh, so, sorry, technological factors, not... Um, uh, so if you've got any ideas around those, please go ahead and, and paste, post those. Uh, there's no uh, wrong idea or wrong um, way of doing it. So it is meant to be fairly creative. Uh, and so I do encourage you as we are listening to the speakers, uh, to engage with the the, um, the boards. 
and I can see that uh, there's quite a few on you. If you don't like the number of uh, arrows flying around, you can actually turn that off. So up the top um, corner next to the, the little icons, there's a, a way to turn off those, uh, those icons um, whizzing about. Uh, I personally like to see them because it just shows uh, where people are working on. So with that, uh, I, I do employ you to engage um, and I'll hand it over to Michael to take us away with the first speaker. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, it's frenetic, but very entertaining to watch all those um, arrows moving around. <laughs> Let me just um, share my screen. <clears throat> just bear with me for one second. Everyone's having a good day. All right, can you see my PowerPoint screen now? Okay, fantastic. All right, so I guess uh, I'm very conscious of the fact that we um, we definitely don't want to be uh, just talking at you the whole session. So what I'm gonna try and do is be as sort of provocative and stimulate as much of the discussion, which is really the main uh, uh, re reason to etra of these of these initial workshops, uh, and I'm also going to try and be as um, inclusive and wide ranging as I can. Um, people who know me may think I'm obsessed with robot cars, which is completely true, but I'm going to try and be objective in covering sort of the bigger picture, um, especially as it as it uh, per, uh, with respect to a workshop on this topic in general. Um, so I'll very briefly introduce, um, I guess, the perspectives that we're uh, bringing to this very brief presentation. Uh, I'll touch on autonomous vehicles. Uh, where are we at in 2020? But then I'm going to talk about five key considerations. Um, and I've put these into the Miro board as well. Um, and these are really just to meant to stimulate discussion, um, not just in robot cars, but also sort of in all the on-flow effects of these technologies. So it's meant to be as um, sort of wide ranging and inclusive as possible. <laughs> So I come from QT. We have a large robotics center there. Um, we're very well connected um, all around the world and have a lot of collaborations and projects uh, in all sorts of robotic spaces, including uh, specifically in the autonomous vehicle space. Uh, and I guess a lot of the insights we bring to this are from those connections uh, all around the world. Australia uh, is a fantastic place to live, um, but a lot of the action is, is understandably overseas, especially in the States at this stage. And that's the perspective I guess we bring to this conversation. Where are we at with uh, autonomous vehicles and, and related technology? Well, it's been a while since they've sort of become very much in the public uh, eye. Um, we've had a number of high profile incidents which have received um, extensive amounts of publicity um, and analysis, um, a, a few tragic fatalities, and those sort of incidents have really um, brought to the fore the, the, both the pros and cons of the technologies like autonomous vehicles. Um, even before COVID, uh, the consensus was we were coming to a bit of a uh, inflection point in the industry where there was a lot of consolidation. Some of the smaller players were, well, many of the smaller players were either shutting down or pivoting or joining forces with larger players. Um, and even this week, there were many announcements, uh, BMW seizing its uh, automation agreement with Mercedes-Benz, for example, and many more. And this was pre-COVID and COVID has obviously accelerated uh, this process. Uh, it's also revealed some possible opportunities in this space, uh, but things are changing relatively quickly at this stage. Uh, the money train, the choo-choo money train that generated almost infinite money uh, in this field is slowing down. Uh, personally, I'm not getting as many uh, interesting offers as I used to, which makes me sad. Um, but it's a good um, indicator that the field is maturing somewhat, and some of that maturation is good, but people are also becoming much more skeptical about the sort of short and medium term prospects uh, in this area. And it's really what you call an industry under very intense self-examination, both in terms of the feasibility of the technology, uh, the societal impact, whether it will actually be as beneficial as some people claim, and what are the real holds up to scrutiny um, financial models for actually making money. Um, all of these are sort of in widespread debate at this stage, although some CEOs will just positively tell you that none of these are problems. Uh, and I guess the number one theme that you see across the industry is pivots and redirects. 
So companies are moving from self-driving cars into the sensor space. They're moving into uh, autonomous delivery as opposed to passenger carrying vehicles. Uh, and they're looking at sort of uh, expanding into other fields, perhaps not on-road autonomous vehicles, but off-road autonomous vehicles. Uh, and these pivots are in many cases fairly well developed and fairly well progressed. Uh, so it would be interesting to see how, how they proceed into the, the near future. This is just one of many examples, Neuro. Uh, this is one of our past students, Will, uh, and it's a, a delivery company. And there are technological advantages of doing autonomous delivery um, instead of carrying people. It makes some aspects of the problem much easier. All right, so just to get the conversation going, uh, here are five key considerations. They're not meant to be exclusive. Uh, please add or modify or completely rewrite these uh, in the mirror board, uh, and we'd welcome that. Uh, but this is just to get the discussion going. So I guess the first key consideration is really, we don't know and we have no means of really predicting with any certainty whether we will have widespread high level autonomous vehicles uh, in any particular time frame. It's, it's pretty much impossible to say that it will definitively happen and it's pretty much impossible to definitively rule them out. And to predict a time frame is probably quite folly. So we need to be prepared for this. We need to be able to exploit the opportunities from an Australian perspective, but we need to do this in a way that has maximal benefit even if autonomous vehicles, or at least the widespread robot taxis, don't become a thing. Uh, and that's a very challenging sort of task to set ourselves. The second consideration is sort of the more mundane one, which is we have at least a potentially widespread commercially viable autonomous vehicle model now, which is to have autonomous driving assistance type vehicles, so Teslas being, I guess, the prime example, um, of a widespread technology that is all over Australian roads. We have some of them in Australia, but it's still a very small fraction. Um, but the prospect of this being commercially viable and scalable uh, is much more concrete. Uh, so this is something we almost certainly have to prepare for. And once again, how do we best prepare for it? How do we look at opportunities uh, in this space? Third key consideration is we really need to think more about the, the not, not as glossy opportunities as what I like to call them. So everyone's talking about this, or was talking about this $7 trillion market for uh, robot taxis that are everywhere and no one owns a car anymore. And we've really stepped back from that, at least for the moment. There are all sorts of, I guess, what you'd call secondary areas for autonomous vehicles where they could still play a major role and where they could still be very beneficial for Australia, but they've really received very little attention um, to date. So these are things like autonomous shuttles serving specific communities, uh, autonomous delivery vehicles, uh, robot taxis that operate in very restricted environments, perhaps at airports or in a retirement community and so on, and autonomous vehicles in off-road domains. So, uh, this is mining, agriculture, construction, the big industry, uh, defence, the big industries in Australia, whereby there are already autonomous vehicles operating in these fields and there may be significant advances that can be made. So one thing we need to do is balance this tension between the sort of flagship on-road robot taxi race and these sort of other domains where autonomous vehicles are already deployed to some extent, but perhaps are not as flashy or theoretically lucrative. Fourth consideration is what, what role does Australia play in this race? Uh, and what I'm talking about here, are what are the real opportunities, not the rhetorical opportunities, not the, it would be nice if this was the case opportunities, but what really holds up to genuine scrutiny from a commercial or societal benefit um, perspective for Australia to play in this space. So I put three possibilities here. Um, one is, I guess, can we get involved in specific aspects of manufacture, repair, maintenance and service provision uh, in the context of autonomous vehicles and related technologies? A second one, which I think um, Paul will cover later in this session, is testing and development centres. So where there are already testing and development centres for aspects of vehicle technology in, in a couple of places in Australia, but this is something where we could potentially play a much larger role. And there are several initiatives on the go in this space. And the third one is one that's close to my heart, 
um, which is, can we play a, a significant role in the global stage in the research and technology creation around all of these technologies? Finally, um, I guess there's the cross-fertilization question. So regardless of how far autonomous vehicles become a thing and under what time scale, because there is so much resource and so much talent devoted to this sort of robot taxi holy grail, um, there's a lot of the core advancements in artificial intelligence, in navigation systems, in uh, visual intelligence, in all these relevant technological capabilities is being driven out of the autonomous vehicle space. But all of these capabilities are of, um, in many cases, significant relevance in all other aspects of safety and mobility, sorry, transport and mobility. It could be the, for the safety of current non-autonomous vehicles. Um, all these technologies play a role in smart city concepts. Um, other mobility modes, scooters, um, mass transit systems even could benefit from some of these uh, robotic technologies. The way we manage, build and maintain infrastructure and the provision of services to society, as well as things like retail. Um, all of these things can potentially be impacted by and benefit from the core robotic technologies around autonomous vehicles. And that's another thing we should consider. So I hope that was um, not too rushed. The idea was just to stimulate um, some potential thinking. I hope that I'll, when I switch back, I'll see if anyone started to drop notes onto the Miro board. Um, but now we'll move on to that uh, next stage of interactivity if people want to discuss. And I guess I'll, I'll defer to Andrew and Sue, who have done a heap of these in terms of the exact structure of how we'll run this 10 minute session now. Yeah, well, we can have some questions. Uh, I've got one to, to kick off. And if anybody's got any questions, they can put it in the, the chat window um, and, and we can ask them. Uh, but I do encourage you to uh, to engage on the Miro boards and, and uh, answer some of those those questions. Um, but Michael, you know, one of the things you, you uh, highlighted is the, the amount of activity that is happening out elsewhere in the world. Um, do you see, still see a, a steady stream of talent uh, leaving Australia for those opportunities? Uh, even though that the, as you said, the, the money train is, is starting to to, uh, to dry up? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, uh, a guy told me many years ago that brain drain in of itself is not bad as long as some people come back to Australia, and that, that's very true. There was a period of about five years where it just universally felt like 90% of our top talent was leaving at all ages of se all seniority levels. Some of those people have started to trickle back. And I know there's at least one person on this call who, who are, I'm talking to uh, who has recently returned from the state. So welcome back to Australia. Um, and I think there's an in increase uh, in that. But at the moment, the bulk of our current talent still seems to be overseas. Um, so it'll be interesting to track that and interesting to see whether we can incentivize these people to come back to some of these people to come back to Australia and share their wisdom and experience. Excellent, no, thank you. Uh, Sue, so I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, are you? I can see a lot of uh, dots moving around on the screen. I can see some people are starting to put down some notes. There's a note about readiness. Um, Zoe, did you want to expand on that since you're on the call as well? Sure. Um, um, you can hear me, right? Or yep, cool. Um, yeah, I've just been um, thinking a lot and, and working um, in my consultancy space uh, for readiness of certain roads for autonomous vehicles. But obviously, you know, with the different levels of automation, um, thinking about some of those. Um, I don't want to call them quick wins, but no regrets investment. So keen to hear your thoughts on on those, because I think, you know, lots of upgrades and things, which is great that people are thinking about this. Um, but sometimes we are looking for the exact answer. How do I make my road, my road ready for, you know, uh, full automation, but actually some of the things that we can do um, to get ready for just the, uh, you know, the driver assistance and that type of thing. Sure. It's a great question. Um, I guess the two points that most interest me, and, and once again, people feel, please feel free to chime in with extra notes on the mirror board, is one, making sure that we don't outlay large amounts of expenditure that would be irrelevant if certain technological trends don't come to fruition. 
Uh, and the second one, which is the much more positive version of that is one, and one that I'm particularly interested in is ways we can efficiently improve our current transport infrastructure that will have benefits regardless of whether or not autonomous vehicles are a thing. And a classic example of that would be in a world that I've only recently dived into is the detailed world of uh, lane markings on roads. Uh, and there are huge safety implications for non-autonomous vehicles there or even semi-autonomous -auto vehicles um, and ones where we can make improvements that are guaranteed to be helpful in a significant way regardless. I think that's really where we should be focusing in the short term. Uh, and it's good that we have a board here which goes out to 30 years because I think there's significant differences on that sort of five-year timeline versus that 30-year timeline. There's a question that has come in, Michael, from Surya, and he asks, what types of roles or opportunities will become available for the data scientists and AI engineers when we talk about the roadmap of transport mobility robotics? A great question. So globally, there is, there is still lots and lots of opportunities in transport and mobility. Once again, it's skewed towards autonomous vehicles and these sort of flagship showy areas, and that's true um, even now, although there's been a bit of a downturn. Um, Australia does have some presence in this space. It's just very small. So uh, a number of the universities run projects in this space. There are some companies like Seeing Machines and other ones that do have presences in this space. Uh, the challenge is it's really sort of, it, it feels like it's a little bit of an ad hoc here and there sort of process as opposed to some sort of grand unified push across all of Australia um, with sort of resourcing and funding to match. I, I noticed we have some people on the call from very large companies who have, a, I know have an active interest in this space. Um, and I'd, be, I'd welcome your comments about how um, this push towards autonomous vehicles and related technologies um, might be relevant, not just on the road, but off the road as well. And while oh sorry we have one more question how do we get more buzz around robotics and raise more awareness in the country i like this question this is a good question and, and something a lot of us have thought a lot about like you, you would think that robotics and ai and autonomous vehicle technologies are naturally very attractive right and and they're they are in the media a lot um I think the tension we have here and and the fledgling Australian space industry I think has this tension too. There are the flagship goals which may be 20 years off which are require a lot of resourcing like like going to Mars or something like that or level 5 autonomous vehicles. We don't know how possible they are. We know they'll take a lot of resourcing and we can't predict when they'll happen. That is held in tension against things that might make financial or societal sense right now or in the next three years, so to speak. A lot of those things are not as, as flashy, right, in terms of the public eye, but they're things that actually might make a difference in the near term. Uh, and I think it's a, a tension that we have to manage carefully um, and sort of keep coming back to, because we really need both. We need the aspirational goals and we need to promote those, but we also need to promote real concrete things we can do now. Yeah, we're almost at the end of the time, I think, but I'll just pick out one more. If there are any other questions, I'll pick out one more comment. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, now populating the uh, notes page quite well. Um, there is, someone's mentioning the fact that autonomous vehicles, if they're um, electric vehicles, or even perhaps if they're hydrogen powered vehicles, will be mobile power stations on wheels. And yes, this is this is another great example of how the autonomous vehicle technology and the electric vehicle technology will have a huge influence on all sorts of other factors um, like um, powering homes, like distribution of power, like filling in power, um, power shortages, all those sort of things. Um, and it's something I guess we can explore uh, in this roadmap. Michael, there is one more question that has come in and it might be one that other members of the panel would be interested in exploring as well. And that is that there's been a lot of talk about government infrastructure spend over the coming period. Do we know if any of that is targeted at enabling mobility? Does anybody, any of, the, in, any of our co-chairs have some insight?
We can't hear you, Ian, at the moment if you are responding. Let's try that. Uh, we, we know that uh, our, uh, our state jurisdictions are spending uh, a lot of money at the moment on uh, transport infrastructure. Uh, and we, can, we know also that the Commonwealth Government is, is looking into the future to try to um, assess the, the uh, future demand for movement, both of, of, of goods and people, to then form a view about what further infrastructure investment is going to be required. So the sort of part answer to your question is, is yes, there is, there is already substantial investment uh, going in and, and being spent and the infrastructure being built. And the, the question of what to do in the future is, is very much a live one, but it hasn't been resolved. Thank you, Ian. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you for everyone contributing on the mirror boards. Next, I'm going to, uh, well, next, actually, I think we are going to address, um, or, or did you, have we adequately addressed Brett's questions, do you think? Can I, because I work closely with Brett, maybe I can just speak for 30 seconds just to highlight a couple of the things that he'd probably want to bring up. Um, yeah, that'd be excellent. Thank so you. Brett's, Brett's um, CEO of the Motor Trades Association of Queensland. So automotive, in despite the fact we have no large scale manufacturing in Australia, automotive is still a very large sector in Australia and in Queensland. Um, there's several hundred thousand people are directly or indirectly involved with it around Australia and many thousands in Queensland alone. Um, the industry, um, the sector is relatively agile in terms of responding to change. So uh, this is a trend you see throughout all new technologies. The sector, it, which is MTAQ is responsible for a lot of uh, training of people in this sector. Uh, and they've responded to things like electrification. So there are now courses that mechanics uh, and other people can do, which will upskill them, enabling them to deal with a lot of the recent technology in electric vehicles. I guess one of the key um, challenges here is to retain relevance of that sector how will they respond to future technology trends around robotics and autonomous vehicles? For example, will we have the right to repair, to maintain, to even access autonomous vehicles if they're deployed uh, in Australia? And the same goes for other forms of future mobility, scooters, um, uh, shuttles, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another key point that I think Brett would want to talk about is where are the specific narrow areas, at least initially, where Australian manufacturing can compete. So we're probably not going to build fleets of millions of electric vehicles that can sell all over the world right away or next year, but there is the potential to produce bespoke or specific fleet capabilities. You could imagine developing and manufacturing uh, EVs that service the fleet requirements of certain specific sectors, for example, freight, or delivery or other sectors like that. So it'd be interesting to get everyone's thoughts on where we are most likely to be able to play a competitive role uh, in this area. And then the other thing um, Brett has brought up, uh, once again, something he spends a lot of time doing, is what is the role of government across um, all of this? And this is obviously an incredibly uh, complex and nuanced issue. Um, and it's easy to complain about sort of things moving too slowly or things waiting to catch up. But it'd be interesting to have some sort of objective thoughts from everyone on where government will play the biggest role and particularly where is government's role critical in a way that the other sectors um, cannot do. Um, so I guess um, we can dive into the Miro board now for a few minutes, Sue, uh, and, and sort of fill in some thoughts around these questions. Yes, thanks. That would be great. I think if we go until um, yeah, have about six minutes on the mirror board. So do you want to sort of run and pull out questions or things that pop up which look interesting? Yes, there, there are no questions from the audience at this stage, but I need to go and have a look at the mirror board and see if there are some questions there.
So just on the comment of um, the government's involvement or role, um, you know, one of the things that I would like to see and I've seen elsewhere in the world where, and I'm sure Paul might have a comment around this um, with his exposure to Pittsburgh and, and other places uh, around the world, um, and that is uh, enabling the right policy. Uh, so I was operating out of um, uh, Nevada for, for many years and around the time I was there uh, when the announcement came through uh, on the um, uh, regulations for allowing on highway autonomous vehicles, uh, in particular the, the trucks um, that came through. So I think that's, that's a key role is that enabling policy. Uh, but the other thing I think that they can do is uh, is enable sort of demonstrators and, and sort of ways of, of, of overcoming um, the confidence barrier uh, and potentially attracting um, additional um, uh, I guess activity, getting a bit of excitement. So yeah, that's the way I see the government playing a key role, but I'd love to hear anybody counter that. I just mentioned uh, we have to go away and write with your input a, a chapter on all of this. So please feel free to plug your reports, white papers, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because that will all be very useful. Um, normally, the problem is you have people plugging their stuff too much. In this case, we'd really like you to sort of plug what you've been doing because it's all relevant to what we're trying to do here. Yeah, to add on your point, uh, Andrew, I think from a government perspective, what what we need and what we um, what government can enable is how we integrate that back, how we integrate, you know, not just autonomous vehicles, but um, mobility in general, how we integrate that across, you know, the different disciplines as well as, um, you know, coordinating uh, government industry together, because it's not just going to be, um, you know, one sector, just government or just private industry or um, academia, we actually need everybody across the board. So I think, um, you know, the work that uh, iMove is doing is, is it's really great to start um, having those conversations across, across you know, different sectors, um, etc. But then also, how does that? How do we ensure that we are um, keeping the public good front of mind? Um, and I think you know, Michael was talking about that a little bit. The shiny, you know, the shiny things that are really awesome, and um, you know, we want them. But actually, how do we then use this sexy smart money to? fill in some of the blanks that we haven't been able to solve. So some of these really complex um, issues uh, in transport and mobility. So I think government has a huge role and they have to be without the pun, be in the driver's seat for this. So I, I can't identify who wrote it, but someone's identified on the board that one thing that makes Australia uh, strong in this case is we have the raw battery materials. We're one of the major suppliers of this stuff. So that's a great example of where Australia has a real uh, unique advantage or at least position uh, that can be built on um, in this area. We also have a lot of space um, if we want to test and try this stuff. I mean, America also does, but I think we have a lot of space, um, which goes back to one of your points, Michael, around you know testing this this stuff. And we also have you know fairly unique conditions. Um, reading your report uh, earlier, or QT's report, and iMove and um, TMR's report about the unique conditions that Australia has that we need to deal with. So I think we have a lot to offer. So one of the key one of the key roles here for government is is that the government is largely responsible for uh, uh, operating the transport system on which all these vehicles are going to operate. So to the to the question of what role can government play to encourage the uh, the progress of our uh, autonomous vehicle industry, it it actually goes to the question of what role autonomous vehicles can play in the transport of people and goods. And as, as we can evolve that value proposition, so then the government will be attracted to uh, supporting the introduction and, and, and progress of those technologies on the transport network, because it's the government's first focus is transport effectiveness, not necessarily 
technology advancement. Uh, and, and to that end, you then have a sort of a, a, a difference in, well, um, some different perspectives from prospectively the Department of Industry that focuses on manufacturing. So manufacturing of vehicles, remanufacturing of vehicles, manufacturing of batteries and the like. And the Department of Infrastructure that cares about the network on which all these vehicles uh, operate. Uh, so when we think about attracting government interest, government investment, government focus, even government policy, we, we have to distinguish in our heads you know, which aspect of uh, autonomous vehicles we are most focused on. Uh, is it the manufacturing and servicing of the vehicles or is it the use of the vehicles in the movement of goods and people? Um, that determines where, where you go in government to get support. Thanks, Ian. And uh, there's still a little bit of activity happening on the Miro board, and I'm not sure whether you're active on that, Paul, Lucy, but there is a comment here on how there needs to be more trial cities, locations, for example, like Rockhampton, and make it an autonomous proving ground. You might be talking about that a little bit later. So don't feel you have to answer that now. Um, but we might leave the Miro board and uh, I think go to our next presenter, Zoe Ether, who is going to be from my smart community who is going to be talking about what aren't we talking about enough in smart mobility. Thanks, Zoe. Thank you so much, Sue. I'm just going to share my screen. You can see that, it's big. Excellent. Um, okay, hi everyone, my name is Zoe Ether. I am from My Smart Community and I also host uh, the Smart Community Podcast. Um, now this map that you see here is my Winston Churchill Fellowship and I was fortunate enough to travel around the world uh, this year, uh, sorry, last year. If it was this year, I wouldn't have been able to go, uh, been able to go because um, it was right when the COVID-19 um, hit us and I was felt very lucky that I was able to travel the year before. So basically what my Winston Churchill Fellowship was, was around researching smart mobility. And uh, I guess when I put my application in, I did talk about, you know, the sexy, shiny stuff of autonomous vehicles and flying taxis and finding out what's happening around the world. But when I got into it and where I, um, when I went on my trip, I realised that what I was really interested in is how does it affect people and how does it affect communities? So I looked at what the current transport network looks like in each place, what their biggest pain points were, so what was everyone talking about, um, and then what are they thinking about the future? So I wanted to travel to places that you know sh were showing best practice, but also places that had some of the biggest pain points. The global issues, what is everyone talking about? Everyone's talking about congestion. Everyone's talking about pollution. Everyone's talking about connectivity, as in being able to get connected, particularly to uh, regional areas, so outside the city. Um, we're talking about population growth. We're also talking about inefficiencies in public transport. And so these were some of the comments that came out from the number of interviews that I did. You're not supposed to be able to read them all, but just know that there is a lot and everyone's talking about this. And then the next thing, the WTF, so what's the future? Um, this picture here is from uh, when I was in uh, Barcelona and um, my city mapper suggested that I might catapult uh, to my next de destination. And then in the back there, that's Carla, the self-driving car um, in San Francisco. So everyone is thinking about this, what is the future? So what's missing from the conversation? And when I travelled around the world, I travelled to nine different countries in nine weeks and visited over 15 cities. And what I realised is that if I, if I wrote a report on what everyone else is doing, one, it would be very outdated very quickly, um, but also we need to start talking about some other things. Everyone was talking about the different you know, activities that were happening, autonomous vehicles, et cetera. So I wanted to add something different to the conversation. So what aren't we talking about enough? 
So the first one is mobility as a system. So we're talking a lot about mobility as a service, but actually we need the system to function first before we can have the service aspect. So this is having a, a system that, a, a transport network that we can um, actively use, that we can easily use. And we talk a little bit about this uh, later on, but um, that also includes regional areas as well. So this includes mass transit, this includes walkability, um, this includes active transport uh, and you know, potentially autonomous vehicles later on. But also connected vehicles is another uh, topic that uh, we should throw into this conversation because I think there's, and, and I'm keen to get into some discussion with Michael in particular around um, connectivity and how that can feed into this space as well. The next is the status of mobility. So do we actually understand what the current network is doing? What, what are the current services that are available? And these include things like, you know, your local uh, community shuttle bus or your local RSL, um, you know, pick up and drop off bus. Because a lot of the time these are funded by government subsidies or subsidies, et cetera, um, but they actually form part of the network. So do we actually know what is available and what people are using? Are they underutilized? Are they overutilized? What are the gaps? Um, and you can only do this if we understand that, that whole ecosystem. The next is increasing convenient mobility. So this one's very important at the moment, but do we actually need to travel? Um, can we do, you know, can we say, uh, have that meeting remotely. And when I wrote this, you know, we weren't in this current time, um, but now it's even more relevant. So actually starting to have those conversations, starting to push back, well, do I actually need to drive my car to this or, or can I, you know, jump on a Teams meeting or a Zoom meeting or what are we on, WebEx, um, or have a phone call. Uh, and maybe that's one out of five times, um, or maybe that's every time. It, it really depends. And so actually starting to ask those questions. But then also realizing that not everyone can have those uh, ask those questions. So not everyone has that ability to work from uh, their home or work from a you know different space. Some people have to travel, and you know a shopkeeper, a doctor, a nurse, um, a factory worker. And how are we going to prioritize them on the network rather than um, people that may be able to work um, you know by not traveling at all? Uh, the next is regional mobility. So how do we make sure that we are including regional areas in our planning? And this isn't just about you know region to region, but it definitely is, um, but also having that whole region approach, so including the city, but then also those outer areas as well. How do we ensure that you know they are part of the conversation and they get included in that system? And the next is mobility for whom? So who are we actually planning for? And continuing to ask those questions are we trying to improve um, the public transport pr transport for the people with the most at stake? Um, maybe people that are in lower so socioeconomic um, areas and how do we actually make sure that they are connected to the network? Um, particularly people that are relying on this network to go to school, um, have access to education um, or you know, adult education, uh, jobs, um, uh, even increasing, you know, job security and those type of things. So how, when, when we are planning these, you know, the new networks and new transport, who are we actually planning for? And the next is holistic mobility. So this is about actually not thinking about mobility and transport just as the mode. So just as, you know, the autonomous vehicle or just as the bus or just as the train, but actually how does it feed into all the other areas that um, it affects? It affects whole communities. Um, it affects, uh, you know, we're talking about government's role. Um, it affects so many different areas, healthcare, all those type of things. So how do we actually integrate across those different disciplines to have a more holistic approach? Uh, the next and the last one is sustainable mobility. So rather than um, just creating uh, more and more, but how are we actually making it cleaner and greener? And this includes things like, you know, behavior change, um, but also making places more walkable, more, more livable, um, in, including low emission vehicles, that type of thing. But actually thinking about that whole of life, um, and we were just talking about, you know, battery technology, but how do we consider the end of life facilities in um, our mobility choices as well? I think that's all I had. Um, again, just wanted to make some comments and actually just start that conversation. So very keen to hear um, everyone else's thoughts, if I can work out how to stop sharing. There we go. 
Thanks, Zoe. Uh, there is one question, but I think it's a follow up from the Miro board, and that is uh, while we may be in a position for importing electric vehicles, those vehicles are likely to be operated and controlled through organisations similar to Uber. Do we see that there may be some form of government licensing similar to current taxi licences? Anyone, any of the co-chairs want to answer that question? I mean, I think there's lots of, I'm probably not the best person to answer it necessarily, but I think there's so many possible futures. Um, and so I think that's where having the government in the driver's seat, but um, having those strong partnerships, uh, we need to start having some of these you know, conversations and getting the, the experts um, as, you know, the policy writers, as well as the technology providers um, in the same room. So the disruptors and the regulators um, can, can be in the same room and have these discussions. Uh, Sue, I've got an observation and, and maybe a comment that's related. So one of the things that I've seen also is this uh, sort of trend around the, you know, doing what's right uh, in regard to rideshare and some of those other um, uh, applications. And so uh, seeing a, um, a sort of a lean towards, um, you know, by taking a ride or, or jumping in a car where actually it delivers, whether it's, a, and it's an electric vehicle, so you kind of get a, a feel good, uh, um, uh, sort of sense from that that you're actually you know using a, a cleaner um, a, um, propulsion um, system um, but also you know choosing uh, options that uh, that allow and we're seeing this already like people choosing um, you know Ola versus Uber versus you know the other ones based on their uh, how they treat people and, and the perception uh, in the community so I think there's going to be a rise of those types of options uh, of people making smarter choices uh, around their, their mobility solutions as they become more available and as the, the, um, the options uh, become more uh, verbose in terms of the impact. Uh, so if people want to make sure that they're, they're um, uh, you know, uh, doing, wanting to reduce their carbon debt, for example, uh, and choosing the, the, the mobility option that can help them with that objective, I think we're going to start seeing more of those types of things. Uh, I'll just make a quick observation. Having spoken with most uh, state governments and, and the federal government, my sense is that their first focus is actually to um, uh, restore the community confidence in public transport as a, uh, a material uh, solution for their, trans their, their movement needs. Uh, and that's, of course, clearly challenged by the COVID situation. but you know, it was the situation before COVID and it, it, it continues to be the situation, albeit that COVID has set everybody back a bit. Because, and they, they take that view because the prospect that everybody might need to use the roads network for, to satisfy their transport requirements is uh, leads us to a path of, for, towards horrendous uh, congestion and, and difficulties. So, um, my sense is that the, the governments are not going to be, are not particularly focused on electric vehicles. They're not even particularly focused on autonomous vehicles, but they are particularly focused on helping the community uh, satisfy their movement requirements, their travel needs uh, in, a, in a convenient and easy to use way. Uh, and that's largely con uh, considered to comprise public transport, but but clearly it will comprise public transport and a degree of first mile, last mile and, and road usage for those destinations which aren't served by public transport. So th that is where I think the, the, the government emphasis is and is going to be in the, in the future. Thank you very much, Ian. So Zoe, there aren't questions for you through the Q&A function, but there's a lot of stuff happening on the Miro board at the moment. And watching it. someone has uh, asked of the many concepts that you were presenting, um, which ones benefit the most or least from robotics AI automation? Yeah, it's a really good question and something I've been um, thinking about um, as, you know, being involved in this. And I think there's quite a lot around, um, and, you know, when we talk about robotics and, and automation, um, we need to also talk about data and what um, data is being generated and how we can use that. So the status of mobility, um, definitely you need baseline data and then you need 
further data to be able to measure and monitor. Um, I think there's there's quite a bit in you know uh, increasing convenient mobility, for example, is and it's kind of very basic digital infrastructure that is required. Um, so then we can continue to you know, build our digital um, leadership and um, I guess uh, that etiquette that's going to change and how we actually lead in a digital world and um, what um, technology can help us do that. Um, and automation, I guess, is, is um, definitely something that we need to consider about which jobs are going to be automated and, and not and um, how we, I guess, uh, protect ourselves from being um, taken over by, um, you know, automation and or being able to lift our game and creativity and curiosity and, and that type of thing. Um, but I think there's lots in regional mobility as well. Um, definitely on-demand services um, and, you know, whether they're autonomous um, or connected or both. Um, I think there's lots to be uh, said in that space as well um, to actually, uh, you know, uh, we talked a lot about Rockhampton being a proving ground. I'd also say Tulpa wouldn't be a bad place either. Um, I'm not biased at all since I live here. And so, yeah, I think there's lots we can do to really open up and uh, and start talking about regional areas as places to, to test and try this um, technology and, um, yeah, be, be those hubs for robotics and automation. Um, just uh, building on that, Zoe, you know, um, those of you who, who have been involved and in, interacted with Oxbotica and the, the folks in, in Oxford, you know, they're essentially a little regional um, uh, sort of uh, area and, and their objective to become, you know, the downtown Oxford uh, town to be um, the only way that you can get a vehicle in there is that for it to be driven autonomously. So I'm not sure, Michael, if you know uh, where they're at with that uh, that objective, um, but I, I totally agree with you, Zoe. That, uh, there's some regional areas, and I think uh, Paul or Sue, you were indicating that Paul is uh, keen to see more test cities or test towns um, in Australia, and I think that's a huge opportunity. I have a question, but please go to the mirror board if you. Um, well, it's related to what people are saying on the mirror board, though. So, so there's there's really two categories of things here, right? There's things that people think will make them ludicrous amounts of money and which they will pursue regardless of. Um, and then there's a whole heap of stuff, which is stuff we should do, will help people, will help society, will help cities, which will mostly lose money or break even. How do we motivate or encourage the relevant parties to support and pursue those activities. And this must be a problem that's not specific to transport, right? It must be a universal problem. Um, how do we do that? I think I would be making ludicrous amounts of money if I had the exact answer to that, Michael. Um, but no, I, I agree. I think um, people talk a lot about, you know, government being uh, playing in spaces that are failed markets, right, and transport being one of those. Um, but I think if we can start thinking more holistically, and, and I think that you know this is it's a kind of a whole governance model around um, where we are saving money in, say, healthcare because we have uh, more walkability. How do we measure and monitor those things? Because if we don't do that, then and, and it's just like oh, our public transport is costing X. That doesn't tell you the whole story around, um, you know, what it's saving um, overall. And I think we, I think we need to measure things other than GDP, right? We need to measure things like um, health and and wellness and um, happiness. And I've been having a lot of conversations um, with people um, thinking about these things on the podcast and, and in other and other other conversations. But it is a fundamental change in the way that we um, operate, you know. Um, the, the current system that we operate in. So I, I think that there will be a lot of um, there'll be a lot of time between that and seeing the full reality. But just starting to have some of those conversations and starting to action some of those things. Um, and I think what you need, and I um, have seen some comments on the mirror board here around champions. You need those champions in government that are thinking a bit differently. And that is the you know not to plug smart communities, but that is the smart community approach, right? It, it, it's around thinking differently. It's not necessarily what's the latest and greatest technology. It's around um, how could we do this differently if if the status quo you know wasn't as it was. I'm happy 
see some other people to comment in on that one as well. No, really good point. I have a question for you, Zoe. I've been on your trip um, around the world looking into uh, smart um, uh, communities and, and uh, what they were doing on the mobility side. How much, um, uh, I guess, uh, evidence was was shown of how they're integrating the mobility solutions in with town planning, city planning and, and the like? Was there a tight integration or was it, uh, you know, uh, evidence of a, a bit siloed? Yeah, I mean, there, yes, um, both, uh, you know, places like Amsterdam, you definitely um, got the sense that, you know, when I was talking to um, the, the, the traffic um, director, um, that she wasn't just talking about um, the technology, but how they can integrate, how they've integrated and in land use planning and that type of thing. And um, so I, there was both. Um, when I was able to meet with, say, city government, um, when I only met with their transport team, then I, you know, got a transport lens, but um, the ones that were further integrated would, could understand that I would want to meet with both. Um, and, and actually bring in that land use plan. Um, the other one was um, Barcelona, um, the, the idea of a super block, which is quite an old theory and, and you know, um, not super smart necessarily, but they've now, um, and the people that don't know what it is, it's a, it's a and I'm not a planner, I'm an engineer, um, but I've been hanging out with a lot of planners lately. Um, but it's a planning scheme that basically brings the things that you need closer to you um, and then you um, direct the traffic that doesn't need to be in that area around and so you can only go 10 kilometres an hour and uh, in the middle of intersections are children, children's playgrounds and um, the pedestrian is the priority. So I was standing in the middle of the road taking a photo and instead of someone beeping at me, um, they, <laughs> they're like, oh, they're going to wait for you so you need to get right off the road. I was like, oh, whoops. Um, so yeah, the, the, the pedestrian becomes a priority. Um, so yeah, it, it, and then you can um, connect the different super blocks together with um, public transport. So that was a really interesting thing. And, and the guy um, that I met from Barcelona City Council, like he wasn't transport necessarily, but he could tell me about the, the, how it all integrates together. So yeah, there was definitely some examples where it was the case, but then other examples, I guess, where it's a more traditional siloed approach. But I think the biggest thing was governance um, from a smart city perspective. Um, and I, you know, for Amsterdam, they had this um, Amsterdam Smart City, um, which it doesn't necessarily mean that I, we want smart cities to be siloed out, but it gives them the right amount of headspace where they can actually step away from business as usual until it's integrated into business as usual to actually have some of these conversations, test and try things, that type of thing. The other one is uh, in Dublin, Smart Dublin, and they have a series of um, different projects, so from environment to, um, you know, mobility and that type of thing. And then they've got a test bed where you can test out um, new technologies, et cetera, et cetera. So I think governance is really important. Um, so then we can actually have the right head space and the people in there to actually be able to test and try these things and come up with new things that might not work because in business as usual, you know, you get caught up in, in business as usual. So. That was really important. I'll just throw in at the end of that. Uh, to, you'll be pleased to to hear that after a hundred years of siloed thinking, most Australian states are actively uh, trying to integrate their land use and transport planning functions, uh, led actually probably most most dramatically by uh, TMR in Queensland. Though the other states are are also active. So. It's a, it's a subject that's become uh, pressingly urgent to resolve. Thanks, Ian. And thanks, Zoe. So there's still a bit of activity on the mirror board, so we might just keep that going for another minute or two, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next presentation. Some of the comments on, on mirror board are around accessibility, um, and I think that's so important and um, something I wrote about in my report. Um, and accessibility from a physical perspective, but also a digital perspective. So increasing that digital literacy um, is really key. But then also, yeah, um, and some of the comments here are realising that not everyone is going to get everything online all of the time. So what other channels do we need um, in that space as well? Um, you know, may or may not uh, be a automation or robotics uh, function, but definitely something to consider. Um, and then with, you know, benefits of healthcare, 
that's what we got. So Zoe, on that accessibility, in your mind, does that include, you know, the, the whole, um, I, I guess, monetization, payment and, and, you know, of the, uh, and have it fully accessible. So whether you're jumping on and off a, a, a bus or onto a, a uh, scooter or into a, a uh, autonomous um, a taxi car uh, or even a walking um, a mobile, um, sorry, walking conveyor type, uh, type system. Um, and having that all integrated instead of having different payment systems and different accounts that you have to set yourself up, um, which has been a, a barrier for some things, you know, the, the bicycles, for example, um, I can never get those things to work because whenever you try and sign up to them, there's there's too many hoops to, to, uh, to go through. It might be just me. Um, but when you say accessibility, is that also what you're, you're meaning? Okay. Yes, yes. Um, that seamless access is something that's really important. And I think, you know, we may not get there on the first go, um, but if we we really need to, yeah, continue to aim um, towards towards that. And you know, it might be that, and and it's a it's a tough one because that I think that is a government role um, to to play potentially, um, and how you uh, the, the be the broker um, because you don't just want to monopolize the system um, either. So you know, you can only use say you know, Uber or something, and they own the whole um, train um, tree or whatever. So I think, um, yeah, there's lots of conversations around that and how we enable that um, by still, and with still having that fair and um, competitive system. But seamless access is really important because um, I was talking to my my grandma recently and I was showing her how to use different things on, you know, with COVID and we have our family gatherings now online. Um, and I think, the more seamless it is, um, the easier then I can convince someone like my grandma and then um, we can, I think that's the testing factor, right? If I can teach my grandma to do it. She texts, um, it's her birthday today, She I send her a text for her birthday. Uh, but yeah, how will we actually continue to integrate that in? But then increasing that digital literacy is really important, but then, and I don't want to go into this too much, but data literacy. So, not only is it seamless, but we also need to be aware of what our data is doing um, and, and are we okay with the way that it's being used and operated. And I think that's another one where um, the government and the public good needs to be um, right front of mind when we when we do um, our, you know, developing these systems as well as um, interacting with them and um, particularly people with, um, with that ha may have low digital literacy and data literacy, how do we bring them up to speed, but then also how do regulation and policy protect protect those people as well. The data point is supremely important. So many of the biggest opportunities are around seamless data sharing across private, public, uh, public transport, private transport boundaries uh, across all sectors. And of course, that brings a huge quandary in terms of privacy and all that sort of stuff. So there's a big tension there. Yeah, totally agree. Multidisciplinary approach has to come in, um, and you can't just have the tech people in the room. You can't just have the policy writers in the room. You can't just have the privacy experts in the room. We need all of us in the room so then we can have these combos. Yeah, thanks, Zoe. Um, yeah, that was great discussion. Um, I will hand over to our next presenter, uh, and that is Paul Lucy from Project 412 who is going to talk about Australia's path to the future of mobility. Thanks, Paul. All right, uh, is my screen sharing yet? Almost. We, it's, we're viewing a black, oh, here it is. Can you see it now? Yes, good to go. All right. Uh, so first of all, I'd just like to thank Andrew for finding that fantastic picture of, of me um, uh, to put on the mirror board there. Thanks for that. I look very distinguished. Um, all right. So a uh, bit, of, bit of my background. Um, the last couple of years, I've uh, been traveling around the world uh, looking at autonomous equipment. My background is in mining. Um, so I did autonomous equipment in mining for many years. Uh, so here is just a snapshot of the various um, uh, autonomous vehicle companies I've looked at in the last couple of years. I think I'm up to, to 15 different autonomous vehicles I've been in on road going variety. Uh, some of them are absolutely amazing and some of them are absolutely rubbish. Um, 
Unfortunately, I can't tell you uh, which ones are which because they make you sign a big fat NDA before you hop in them. Um, but uh, some of them uh, do some amazing things uh, and you can see the potential uh, in some of the, the places that you go. Uh, some of the hotspots uh, in terms of autonomous vehicles uh, that I went to, I mean, you have, you have San Francisco, um, you also have Pittsburgh. So Pittsburgh alone has six different autonomous vehicle companies uh, there and operating. I was there for two years. Uh, so it's in interesting to know that uh, the six companies in Pittsburgh, that's six more than what Australia currently has. So that depresses me a bit. Um, Boston was an interesting place. Shenzhen in um, uh, China, and also Guangzhou in China were, were two places uh, that were quite impressive in terms of what they were doing. Uh, what Didi was doing in Beijing with the, the data from autonomous vehicles was absolutely truly amazing in terms of managing traffic. That was that was pretty amazing. Um, uh, in Europe, uh, look to, looking at what's going on in Europe, um, look, without naming any specific European autonomous vehicle company, most of them were, were fairly rubbish, unfortunately. But um, we'll, we'll leave that as it is. Right. So where does that leave Australia? So one of the things I did when I got back to, to Australia is I wanted to do an autonomous vehicle program and we wanted to map out all the different components uh, in, in, that, uh, in that landscape. Uh, and so having done this in, in mining a few times, and now mining has several hundred commercial uh, surface automated bits of equipment. Um, but what people don't know is there's about five and a half thousand pieces of automated equipment underground. Uh, and that's been going on for 25 years. Um, so the underground environment in mining um, is, is highly automated, particularly uh, in, in Australia uh, in that respect. So a lot of those, those things have been solved. Um, but the advantage of doing something in mining is you don't have pedestrians. Um, uh, it's very controlled. It's a very regulated process. Uh, so you can put in um, systems. Now, in saying that, they're all extremely expensive. Um, uh, they're actually more expensive than uh, an autonomous vehicle that, say, an Uber or a Waymo currently builds, uh, and they're very complicated uh, in terms of what they do. So then we broke it up into different sections. Uh, so you have the vehicles themselves, but building a mobility landscape is more than just having autonomous vehicles. Uh, how are you going to move people? Data and analytics is, is huge. Uh, we just touched on that briefly, um, and that's probably where some of the value uh, is. Uh, in this entire process. Certainly from, from an Uber and a Waymo perspective, this is where they're going to, to earn most of their money. Uh, consumer finance energy. Uh, in the future, all autonomous vehicles will be electric, uh, and that gives you some um, ability to um, uh, do some fairly interesting stuff with, with electric vehicles. For example, by 2035, 20% of all the power generated in Australia at any given time, 20% of that will be in electric vehicles. So it's a, it's a huge component uh, in terms of um, the energy market uh, in that space. Uh, but probably the boom industry that I see uh, for an Australian perspective is in smart infrastructure. I think that's one area, one area where we can definitely play. Um, because it's so new, we don't have a huge amount of area to, to catch up uh, in that space. Uh, so this is uh, this was done from a KPMG report a couple of years ago and out of the G20 countries in terms of uh, where Australia was for automated. Uh, so Australia ranks 15th, which I thought was pretty generous. Um, uh, New Zealand, every time they've done this, ranks higher than, than Australia, and having a look at the components uh, in New Zealand and the regulatory approach that they have there. Uh, I would say that they're probably be higher than Australia at the moment. Um, now, the reason I say that is because I've tried to do a number of large scale uh, autonomous vehicle programs uh, in Australia. And so when we started to look at this, we looked at the cost value of moving people around. Uh, and so this is based on uh, ride hailing trips. Uh, and so this is the price point at which uh, those autonomous companies are looking to make autonomous vehicles work. Now, when your autonomous vehicle costs $400,000 um, and you're only getting $2.50 a trip in Asia, and it doesn't really stack up. But even at $14, it doesn't stack up. Um, but that only tells part of the story. So if you break it down per kilometre, and a couple of examples I will give you is that uh, the public transport cost uh, in Western Australia is $1.20 per kilometre per person. 
um, of which uh, the, the, the public only pays about 50 cents. In Sydney, it's about 95 cents per kilometre. Uh, Uber is $2.11 uh, per kilometre. Now that's for one person. If you start putting two or three people in an Uber vehicle, it starts to look uh, a lot more attractive. Um, so when we were looking at running a, a project uh, in, in Australia, and we, we chose a city, Caratha, to actually do that, uh, that's the kind of model we, we ran at. And so we were looking at a much smaller vehicle than what you have uh, using public transport. We were looking at no more than an 11 seats um, uh, to make that actually work. Uh, and we could get that down about $3.80. Now that's still um, not a level five vehicle. Um, that's uh, probably a level two vehicle, We've still got a driver, um, but there's some of the cost implications that you have in trying to get that price down uh, in a place like Australia, let alone uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, so this is what the market looks like uh, in Australia from uh, mobility as, as a service. And so this is the infrastructure component of, of which we looked at. And so these are the major clients. Uh, so the, the reason I did that is uh, to look at um, where we currently sit uh, in this space. So this is SCAC. It's the leading system uh, in Australia from a traffic management perspective. Uh, and so we tried to run a project uh, in Caratha, where we wanted to change this. This is the, the current SCAT system uh, that's used in, in most states um, and also in the town of Caratha. Now they had seven traffic lights and we wanted to replace that with this system. So this system would have been a smart uh, traffic system, which would have allowed for autonomous vehicles um, in, in that solution. Uh, when we took it to government, uh, they turned around and said, oh, that's, that's too complicated, won't match our SCAT system. Um, we would prefer if you did it uh, somewhere else. Can you do it overseas? Can you do it in Singapore? Can you do it in, on the East Coast? So they just would never give us permission um, to do a project like this. Uh, so we scouted around other towns and we found pretty much the response from most state governments in Australia is they were never going to allow us uh, to do this project. Um, it was too difficult for them to get their heads around uh, in terms of that. The first thing they always said is who else is doing it? Can you give us an example? Can you do it in a paddock? Um, how about you do it when there's no traffic? Um, and that's not how it actually works. So this is a town in um, Ohio, just outside of Columbus, Marysville. So it's, it's roughly the same size as Carapa, um, and it's almost an exact replica of what we wanted to do uh, in Carapa. And so we looked at uh, 100 odd towns in Australia um, of, of around somewhere between 15 to 35,000 uh, people, which we thought was ideal. That's that's kind of where some of the more successful projects have occurred. Uh, and and this project has been extremely successful. So by Ohio, if, if you're going to look at the future of mobility anywhere in the world, then I would suggest you should go to Columbus, Ohio. Uh, they have this smart uh, Columbus uh, project. It started off as a, a $50 million uh, grant from, from, this, from the federal government there. They've turned that into $500 million and now they're on the way to a billion dollar project around smart mobility. Um, and they've made some massive uh, inroads uh, in that respect. I think they have four or five different autonomous vehicle uh, testing companies there now, as well as a uh, huge push in terms of public transport. Um, but to give you an indication, they're, they're very happy that they're, they're a high use public transport city uh, in the US, um, but it's still uh, about 5% of the public transport use that's in say a city of like Perth and Columbus is about the, the, the size of Brisbane. So it just shows you that the, uh, there's a big difference in terms of public transport in the US versus public transport uh, in, in Australia uh, from that respect. So these are the components that we looked at uh, when you start to look at mobility as a service and all the kind of things that occur. So this, this is where um, uh, Uber uh, sits now. But what I saw in China, particularly from, uh, from Didi, uh, is in Beijing, they've got an agreement with the, uh, the city of Beijing that when their cars start to slow down, uh, in the ring city, if you've ever been to, to Beijing, and I'm sure most of you haven't, it's a, it's a big ring city and it locks up and you can't move for hours, is what they do is they turn all the lights red um, going in there. And as soon as all the Uber cars, or the DD cars, I should say, start to move again, then they start to, to turn the traffic light um, back on. And that's reduced traffic in the city of Beijing by 30%. So that's using smart data for good. Um, and so that's kind of where you start to see what you can do 
it's smart infrastructure once you have connected vehicles um, in that respect. Um, so there's some of the, the value aspects that, that, that is, uh, you started to see come out of some of the mega cities. Uh, so I mentioned uh, electric vehicles. Uh, so um, you're, you're right, we, it's still a, a very brand new uh, component, particularly the vehicle to grid stuff. There's only one vehicle to grid um, vehicle you can get in Australia at the moment, although there's, there's several planned. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the generators in Australia are not prepared. But luckily, we do have uh, an entire CRC dedicated to that, the, the race uh, CRC. Uh, just got up um, and it's one of their key projects is to look at uh, how electric vehicles can integrate with the grid um, and some do some smart infrastructure. Um, so uh, we're looking at doing a project uh, in Carafa uh, to put a whole series of electric vehicles in to see how that impacts. So these are all the building blocks that you need to understand before you even get to autonomous cars. You need smart traffic lights, you need to understand how your electric vehicles are going to work. You've got to have all these mobility as service components um, before we even get to the autonomous vehicle space. And so these are all regulatory components associated with this entire process. Um, so this is this is where we're at uh, in terms of, of the challenges. Um, and I, I think the biggest challenge that we face uh, in Australia is not technical. I think we, we have the skill set, we have the people. Uh, we have the resources to do it. We're just, um, uh, just so far behind in terms of the, the regulatory uh, approach. Uh, when I spoke to the National Transport Commission about it, I said, look, you know, we, we should be leaders in some aspects of this. They turned around and said they're not going to bring any legislation in um, or any recommendations that do legislation, but any recommendations um, unless it comes through the EU. Uh, and they definitely weren't looking at anything coming out of the US. So it was just a, a, a EU-based component. And they're way behind in terms of what the US is doing and certainly way behind in terms of, of where Singapore is at. Um, and they also suggested that maybe a, a Singapore was a better place uh, to go and do some of this work, which is unfortunate. Um, so I think there needs to be a push from these regulatory bodies or quasi-regulatory uh, bodies uh, in terms of, of doing successful projects um, in Australia. Um, I've tried to do a few and it's really, really challenging uh, in this current environment. Um, and I think this is probably the biggest hurdle that we're going to face is how do we actually get past this, um, this regulatory hurdle uh, in the country. Um, and lastly, uh, so this, this was put together by, by Pittsburgh, as I mentioned, they have six autonomous vehicles. And so this is the statute of um, uh, guidelines given to the autonomous company. So this was after the Uber incident um, uh, a few years ago where they, where they uh, killed someone in, in Tucson. Um, and so the city went to all the autonomous vehicle companies uh, in the city and it asked them, um, uh, what are you actually doing with your autonomous vehicles? And they found out that a lot of them uh, were um, uh, a lot less safer than, than they expected. For example, at the time, this was only a few years ago, the Uber autonomous vehicle, which they thought was one of the most advanced, uh, couldn't reverse, couldn't go backwards. Um, uh, and the amount of times that the driver uh, took charge of the vehicle was a lot higher than what they thought. So what they did, they said, well, no, now we need to start from scratch. You need to be very open. And everything you do needs to be for the benefit of the, benefit of the public. So they made them sign this charter. Uh, and then they put together a, um, uh, a committee and it was uh, six members of the general public um, and six of the autonomous vehicle uh, companies. And they all get together um, once a month um, to talk about the challenges associated with autonomous vehicles uh, in the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, so I thought that was um, uh, quite a uh, progressive uh, process in how you actually manage that um, process going forward. And that is the end of my presentation. Oh, oh, sorry, we're going to move over to the Miro board. We have no questions have come in, but I can see that people have been active on the Miro board. Got a couple of questions, Sue, if I can. Um, so you mentioned race. Uh, is, do you know if they're um, tied in with the FBI, um, so the Future Battery Initiative CRC as well? Because they kind of go hand in hand, don't they? I don't really know. They're, they're, they're two different. Um... CRC is doing two different things. I think one, the, the FBI 
CRC is all about um, uh, the battery industry as opposed to battery use. There is a, there's a talent component from the FBI CRC around use. As you would understand, you need to understand the use, uh, but the FBI CRC is, is all about uh, building a battery industry as opposed to um, the, the use of the batteries in, in that space. Another question I've got is, um, do you see opportunities? I know you mentioned uh, how the how um, our wonderful regulators slash uh, um, uh, uh, politicians or government folks uh, are looking for guidance uh, from EU, um, but we have these relationships with sister states. So Queensland has uh, their sister state is Nevada, uh, the US. Is there opportunities to potentially leverage those uh, those relationships? And sort of drive some of those uh, collaborations that you mentioned that are happening in Pittsburgh. Yeah, look, yeah there is. And what we try to put a ton of vehicles on the road in, in Western Australia, the, the challenge we faced is that um, uh, they had a very good model for doing shuttles. Um, and, you know, uh, Perth was one of the first places in the world to put a shuttle on a public road. But they never progressed it, they never kept up in terms of where things were going. So the rules they tried to, to put on. Um, uh, made that very difficult. Um, even importing the vehicle into Australia um, is, is very challenging. Um, we did a, a, a massive uh, hassle with the um, uh, WA police um, and uh, various government bodies. Um, and even though we went through that entire process, they said, look, we will never let you put it on the highway. You could only put it at back streets at about 40 k's an hour and we wanted to, to do exactly what they were doing in the us um, which is traveling at highway speed um you know otherwise you, you what are you testing uh, in, in that respect um when we talked about uh what was going on um in the us uh, and so forth uh we were met with a combination of disbelief that that wasn't happening um, versus that, um, well, you know, WA is too small to be doing that kind of stuff. You need to be looking elsewhere. Um, and some of the most progressive cities uh, in the US are not some of the big cities. I mean, Pittsburgh's the only, only the size of Perth, and they've got six autonomous car companies in Australia. It's got 25 million people, and we don't have one. That's a bit of a challenge for us um, going forward. I'd love to see an indigenously grown autonomous vehicle company um, in Australia, we certainly have the talent, we certainly have the, the skill set to do it, um, but there are some, some hurdles to overcome. Paul, well, I just have a, a couple a question and a comment. So we, we could have an indigenously driven group of startups tomorrow, like there are investors willing to put money into it, but they'd disappear overseas within 18 months, right? And there'd be almost nothing you could do to stop them. Um, I have a question. So, uh, and to be clear, this is not um a criticism of the case studies i'm just trying to get at what sort of the messaging we should be putting forward should be in the report so with marysville for example that's like a flagship example of a success story if you take a perspective of someone who doesn't care about robotics or autonomy at all what would they shamelessly copy that because it's going to save their city lots of money or it's going to save them lots of lives what are the concrete benefits that that model potentially would give, even if you don't care about mobility? So I think in, in all the business cases we did was around um, reducing uh, congestion uh, and safety. So that, that were the two aspects um, rather than um, just, I mean, you don't, you know, you and I might uh, do uh, robotics just because it's cool and we want to do it, um, but there's going to be, it's going to wash its own face. There's going to be a business case behind it. Um, and so that's where we, we thought the, the big value add uh, was in traffic management. You know, if you, the WA government, for example, committed to spend $10 billion on roads over 10 years. Um, uh, but if you spent a billion dollars, you could solve those problems intelligently, putting smart systems in. Um, and that's a better use of money, building industry, um, and, and away you go. So I think the business case is there for, for um, uh, building smart equipment, but we are, what we suffer from is the incumbency. Uh, we've had these systems in place for 20 or 30 years um, and no one wants to change them. I mean, the, the, the technology risk is, is huge um, in that respect. So we, we suggested a, a project to main roads here in Western Australia where we would put in four sets of um, smart traffic lights. Wouldn't cost them a set, we'd do it for free. 
Um, and they would pay us traffic as a service if we reduced traffic by, by 20%, that was the measure. Um, but even then, I mean, they weren't motivated to do it because um, you know, it's, it was too much of a, of a step forward for them. What about uh, precincts? I, I know the folks down in Tonsley in South Australia are active to try and sort of stimulate um, some, some innovation work uh, there and I think they, they may already have deployed their, um, their shuttle bus, uh, autonomous shuttle bus um, uh, project uh, or maybe close to, I'm not sure how, how COVID has, has affected that. Um, but you see the role of these uh, sort of innovation precincts as being a, 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 an opportunity to, to, uh, to demonstrate and, and to, uh, uh, to do some of the things that you've been trying to do? So I'm, I'm not a believer in shuttle buses. I think they're an evolutionary dead end. Um, and I think we waste all the money on them for what they, for what they are. Uh, if you look at any successful implementation around the globe in terms of autonomous vehicles and, and autonomous testing, it's always out uh, in an open environment as opposed to in a controlled test area. Um, and Singapore found the same thing when they built their, their little test unit there in, in Singapore is after the, last, the first few months, nobody used it because you, you weren't getting any value out of it. You've got to be doing it on real roads with real people and real environments to be learning what needs to be done uh, in that space. And you're not going to do that with a shuttle either. You know, I can walk faster than these shuttles. And they're terribly expensive. Uh, yes, but uh, I, I think there's some, some there's still some merit in Andrew's suggestion. If you if you step away from the shuttle buses, which uh, are, are really not a particularly efficient form of transport, but to think about precincts as as an opportunity space, or so we say a controlled opportunity space in which you could do something uh, with some sort of automated vehicle, uh, then I think that's likely to be the, the, the feasible way in. It may not be the beautiful way in, but just as Karatha was a precinct uh, and, and a nursing home could be a precinct and an airport could be a precinct and Tonsley Park could be a precinct, you know, they are all opportunities to get started on use of automated or, or relatively automated vehicles. Um, and I think we, it, it, it's incumbent on us to actually find the ones that we can actually stand up and get going. And, you know, never mind that uh, the, the shuttle at Tonsley Park is a bit slow, I, and I agree, but it, it is established to serve a useful purpose to the, to the, uh, the, the Tonsley Park community to get them from the, the railway station up to the, up to the building. So uh, <laughs> it's a small goal, but, it, but nonetheless, it's, it's a real world uh, it's a real world value adding opportunity and to, they're, they're, they're to be applauded for that. What, what's the next one and the next one and the next one that we can stand up and do? I think that's, that's, the, that's the challenge and that's the opportunity for us. Well, so I think from a, a roadmap perspective, I think it's important to tackle why we can't do the large scale projects. I think that's going to be where the roadmap sit is why can't we do a, um, a large scale autonomous vehicle testing? Why can't we get a, a vehicle on the road doing highway speed? Why can't we put it out in, into the city with, with all the other vehicles? I, I find the shuttle is a distraction um, and it always came up in all my discussions is, can't you put another shuttle in? We know how to do shuttles, shuttles are great. Um, <laughs> and, and I think with, with the, the shuttle thing as well is the, the, these universities that go and buy shuttles instead of doing a real autonomous vehicle company, I mean, it's a huge waste of money for a university to be buying a shuttle to move people around a university. I mean, these are all young people that have got perfectly healthy legs and can walk around. Um, whereas there should be more universities like QUT doing real autonomous vehicle stuff. Use that money to do real autonomous vehicle stuff and move the needle, I think, is what needs to be done. Um, I just want to add, I, I went to Ohio um, earlier this year as well, and I was, um, I was, I was impressed, but then also underwhelmed um, because going to the mobility capital of the world, I had to hire a car. And I was a bit annoyed about that. Um, but being there and talking to the people and seeing the integration and, you know, I happened to be there when they were doing a um, smart regions um, uh, meeting and they invited me to speak. And so just that co cooperation um, across the different departments and 
departments, but also the jurisdictions um, was really incredible to see. And I think there's lots of potential there. And obviously it helps to get, you know, a little bit of cash, but then they've, um, you know, built them on that more and more. And I also liked that um, some of their projects um, really focused or, well, I guess a lot of their projects focus on neighbourhoods and people and um, particularly neighbourhoods where they don't have access to public transport or didn't before. Um, so I found that really, really interesting and also looking at um, big challenges that they had. So one is like the, um, a, a prenatal, they had a really high rate of um, uh, infant mortality. Um, and so a lot of that was transport. Uh, it was a transport related issue that the women couldn't get to um, their appointments on time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that was one of their smart mobility projects. And I, and I like that because it's not, it's not super sexy, but it's solving a real issue um, that they had. And um, yeah, they use their, they have an autonomous shuttle because everyone does, um, but they're then using that. The first one was, um, you know, in the city, but then the next one was in a, um, Linden Leap was in a neighborhood. And I'm not sure of the status um, now with COVID, but um, definitely a really, really interesting place and a really, um, I really enjoyed um, meeting the different people and, and you could really feel the ecosystem kind of actually um, working and happening. But I guess, um, I know we want to jump to the mirror board, but um, it's not just mobility that they're looking at, like um, Dublin, Ohio is the other place and, and Westville around smart communities. And so I think um, having that backbone that they had and then, you know, mobility sprouts off that, but then also they're looking at, you know, digital passports and, and you know, things like that. Um, but when you go to the town, it's, you know, a really little quite quaint town and, and quite nice. Um, so, yeah, it, it is a really interesting place. And I, I highly recommend that people um, go and have a have a Google um, on a couple of those places as well. Thanks, Zoe. We're having some great conversation, uh, but we if we don't move on to our next presentation, um, I had said we would finish early, but we might be lucky to finish on time. Um, Paul, is there anything from the Miro board you want to pick up before we move on to the next presentation? I'll, I'll let Ian have his um, time in the sun now. Go for it, Ian. So <laughs> well, I'd like to introduce Thanks, Ian. Christensen, who's the Managing Director of iMove CRC. He's going to be talking about beyond robotics, smart vehicles, smart infrastructure, smart transport. And uh, I will be directing his slide. So any syncing errors are entirely my fault. Thank you, Sue. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to contribute. Um, so iMove is uh, uh, a CRC focused on uh, transport and mobility uh, and more transport and mobility more than uh, just automated vehicles. But of course, uh, automated vehicles uh, sort of fall neatly within its remit because they op present an opportunity to improve that uh, transport mobility uh, uh, transport mobility space in the in the company. Perhaps next. Uh, so, being a CRC, we, we exist to uh, encourage and support organisations to get on with the job of doing stuff that will improve the mobility of people and freight. We particularly want to encourage organisations to take advantage of the wave of digitalisation that's happening across everything that moves. And so that refers to the fact that most people carry uh, uh, smartphones these days, which means they're they're connected while they're on on move on the move. And uh, uh, a lot of trucks already have uh, telemetry attached, so they can be tracked as well. And of course, connected and automated vehicles are, are almost by their nature uh, uh, connected to the to the uh, uh, digital and electronic uh, universe, and so. We see that as presenting a lot of opportunities for companies and organisations to uh, improve their, their uh, commercial offering, offerings and their, uh, the, the performance of the networks for which they're responsible. So I'm, I'm making a sort of a loose connection here between uh, industry partners like, uh, like Cubic and Coda Wireless and Australia Post and, and the like. Uh, with actually state departments of transport, so TMR and Transport for New South Wales and uh, DOT in Victoria and, and so on, uh, because in fact they, are, they all have the challenge to uh, ex uh, draw on the emerging technology to 
improve their service offering and their, the performance of their products. So next two. Uh, so just a little bit about the CRC. Uh, it's, a, it's an independent uh, research platform. Uh, it operates on a not-for-profit basis and it serves primarily network managers, people moving organisations and supply chains. Uh, we've been going for three years in a, in a 10 year uh, journey and we're, we've initiated uh, 42 projects to date. So we, we, we operate a, basically a portfolio of projects. We, we're not really running an agenda per se, so much as trying to support um, organisations who want to do stuff in this space to get on and do it. Uh, so that's just the dimension, so perhaps next. So uh, it's interesting, you know, the, it, the sort of the way that the previous conversations have gone. Um, I set out to try to address the robotics roadmap question, but in the in the transport and mobility space, that necessarily takes us into some adjacent areas, which are not really robotics, but nonetheless they're they're uh, vitally important to support the the evolution, the development and the deployment of more highly automated vehicles, um, which are the sort of subject of interest. So uh, 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 we, could, we could spend a lot of time actually talking about the many interesting issues in transport and mobility, um, some of which uh, Zoe uh, kindly raised before, but uh, that would take us more than two hours. Uh, so I'm going to, to um, try to focus on the three subject areas in front of us, um, smart vehicles, the, the, the data ecosystem in which they operate and some characteristics of the, the network that is going to provide the context for their uh, development. Uh, next. So in the question of AV, so one of the, one of the frustrations I think we all experience is that uh, Australia is taking a very conservative or risk-averse approach. Uh, Paul, Paul reflected on the, the challenges or the challenging conversations he had in Western Australia and with the National Transport Commission. And I, I feel, I feel his pain. I, <laughs> I see the same, uh, I see the same conversations happening in, in with other people as well. So, so that says to me we have that for the roadmap for the for the uh, increased deployment and utilisation of automated vehicles. We, we have to find a way through uh, this sort of uh, risk-averse conundrum that we, we face. And, and so I'm, I've put up here a, a sort of a set of rhetorical but challenging questions. And I, I wonder if, if in the first instance our biggest problem is that, that where we, Australia, is insisting on perfection from our automated vehicles before we'll contemplate letting them loose on our roads. And given that, oh, well, I'm going to make the contention to you and, and Michael, might, uh, <laughs> Michael might reflect on this as well, but that perfection is actually a really, really, really um, high target and unlikely to be achieved anytime soon and, and probably not in our lifetimes. Uh, if that's the tr and if that's true, then where, how can we pragmatically uh, progress towards an acceptance of something less than something that's less than perfect, but nonetheless um, highly beneficial to uh, some part or all of the community? So, hence my question: Do 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 we have to wait until automated vehicles can? Precisely mimic the behaviour of a human-driven vehicle, uh, because if we if that's the requirement, then I think we're going to be waiting a very very long time. Or can we can we accommodate something slightly different? So, in a sense, if it was if it was the case that uh, automated vehicles can only operate in a subset of all possible conditions, so maybe you know they. Uh, they only, they only operate in good weather or they only operate in daylight hours or they only operate when you've got good road markings or, you know, you can think of any, any manner of uh, possible domain constraints uh, that might be applicable. 
could the community actually cope with the introduction of vehicles with those sort of um, constraints on their operational domain? Um, I, I think that's a that's a sort of that's a test that I think we have to to overcome is to um, uh, help the community accept that automated vehicles in their current form are, are in, in, incredibly useful, but they're not actually the same as human-driven vehicles. And so, to get the benefits, we have to accommodate that. I think we'll just slip back a slide, but nonetheless. Um, and in terms of what what is what does the community need to feel comfortable about accommodating these vehicles that which actually might be slightly different from human operated ones? I, I, I think then the the task that we the task that we have to address ourselves to are the the, the what are the aspects of human driving behaviour that we really want the automated vehicles to mimic, and which ones are, do we not care about? How, how are we going to teach automated vehicles to cheat? Um, because that's what human drivers do. And if, if, uh, if we've got cheating human drivers intermixed with uh, law-abiding automated vehicles, we're, we're going to end up with some conundrums um, that frustrate the heck out of other road users. How are automated vehicles going to interact with the other people in the community? Because if, if if the community has confidence that they can at least understand what the automated vehicle is going to do, even if that's different from what a human-driven automated vehicle will do, then they're much more likely to accept their introduction into their landscape. And, and of course, the last point is, so uh, do, do we demand that they, that automated vehicles are infallible? Uh, and I think we, we somehow have to cultivate a discussion in the community to, to lead that leads to an acceptance that you know, the vehicles are fallible and they will always have a degree of fallibility about them, um, just as humans do. Uh, how do we how do we accept and accommodate that? So that they're the, they're the sort of interfaces that I would suggest that we need to work on in order to progress the adoption of automated vehicles. But that's that's the that's the aspects of the vehicles themselves. I think if we go to the next slide, I'll talk about some. Oh, the other direction, yeah. So there are other aspects that are going to be crucially important to supporting the adoption of uh, automated vehicles. And I've, I've bunched, for the purpose of this discussion, bunched it into three uh, groups. Um, there may be other headings as well, and there, there will certainly be other bullet points that could be brought in under each heading. But then, nonetheless, for brevity, let's just keep it at this. So navigation. Um, Michael did a superb piece of work um, a few months ago that demonstrated how radically more uh, effective automated vehicles are if they are fed with a with a, a, a an accurate and and reasonably detailed map of the domain in which they're travelling um, in advance. If we, if we leave all the work all the hard work to the to the smarts on board the vehicle and the vehicle sensors, they 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 struggle. A lot more than than occurs if they are fed with actually a, a reasonably good starting point to which they just have to orient themselves. Uh, and of course, we all know that GPS falls over in uh, urban canyons; it falls over in tunnels. And so, so there's a sort of there's a need for um, uh, outside uh, for. for um, assistance to the vehicle from outside the vehicle, from, from the, the, the environment in which it's travelling, um, that will substantially help improve the vehicle performance and the vehicle's um, uh, reliability for its, its passengers. Uh, there's also the question of, of uh, I've got playing nicely. So, so autonomous vehicles can operate, you know, Completely on their own. That's why they're autonomous. Um, but in in any sort of or in most traffic situations, actually operating on their own is not is, is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Um, a lot of the benefits come from the autonomous vehicle being able to operate cooperatively with other vehicles in its surrounds. So that might mean. Um, uh, 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 
adaptive cruise control, which is which is sort of a, a, a arises out of vehicle to vehicle. Well, sorry, it could be enhanced by vehicle to vehicle communication. It might involve looking over the hill or looking looking up the traffic uh, uh, trajectory towards a traffic jam that's not immediately visible to the to the uh, the subject vehicle, but but it is vehicle visible to other vehicles that are further ahead, and they can be. Um, if, that, if that information can be conveyed from vehicle to vehicle to vehicle, uh, then um, you know the, the the performance of the network can be substantially improved. And similarly, if if there are problems uh, it, on the network, you know it could be incidents, it could be roadworks, it could be it could be blind uh, uh, blind corners. Uh, the the automated vehicle performs much better if it can be fed information. From the environment into its uh, into its um, digital uh, consciousness um, for its own decision making, and then of course, so that's that's the the interaction between the vehicle, the subject automated vehicle, and other vehicles. But there's also a whole domain of interaction between the subject vehicle and uh, uh, and the infrastructure and and other people that are in the on the network. So there, there's a strong interest amongst the transport authorities in improving safety, particularly safety of intersections. And to do that, it's anticipated that there needs to be substantially improved connectivity between people and vehicles as well, or people, or maybe people and their mobile phones and vehicles. So uh, to to get Autonomous automated vehicles uh, more widely adopted. We suggest that uh, a, a fair amount of additional work has to go on in this sort of parallel space of uh, communicating between the subject vehicle and other other uh, uh, stakeholders in the system. And then, of course, coming perhaps more to uh, to Zoe's uh, um, uh, observations. Uh, the, the whole point of having autonomous vehicles, and particularly yet yeah, autonomous passenger vehicles, is to improve people's travel um, uh, options, and and that means that the the autonomous vehicle is actually part of people's travel planning processes, and whether that's uh, planning for uh, for um, uh, rerouting uh, during during a journey because something's happened ahead and and the car needs to take a new path, or whether it's actually um, planning the the whole day's travel uh, through a combination of public transport and automated vehicles, um, uh, by because the traveller can access the whole network of transport options. Um, you know, it, it is a bit moot, but the point is that the automated vehicles have to serve the transport needs of the community and. That means that uh, they have to be compiled into into uh, a, a system whereby they can be engaged and their their engagement can be planned in advance. Um, so I, I think I'll probably leave that one there. They're the they're the sort of elements of the the data system that need to be evolved at the same time as we involve evolve the vehicle capability, and we need to do that in order to extract the. The benefit proposition from the use of those vehicles. So perhaps if we quickly go to the next one. So, at one level, uh, we, we we need to reflect that autonomous vehicles, in fact, all vehicles operate on a on a system, you know, a road system, and the road system has governance of its own. Um, but I actually want to take that idea a, a step further and 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 reflect to you that. So at the same time that we've been busy building, uh, I'm going to say intelligence or uh, um, decision-making capability into the vehicles themselves, so too is there a parallel activity in building um, intelligence into roadside infrastructure, intersection control, uh, network performance, journey planning. All of all of these aspects are um, uh, are being worked on and made uh, progressively more and more intelligent. So we're emerging already into a situation where uh, 
uh, that the, the transport network is actually a network of distributed intelligence. But unfortunately, it's distributed independent intelligence. The, the intelligences are not connected at the moment. And that, that brings with it both a, a, a suboptimality and a risk of uh, uh, dynamic feedback that can actually be quite, um, uh, uh, quite destructive in terms of um, system performance. So, so my, my last call is, is to uh, explore how we might build uh, um, collaboration protocols between um, adjacent independent AI um, that is going to exist in any case in uh, across the, the system, the transport system in which we're going to operate. Because I think that will be uh, uh, ultimately become a necessary condition for the widespread adoption of um, automated vehicles, which are, in, of course, in themselves, all independent AI uh, instances. And, and it's an area where, in, in fact, I think there is uh, still not a lot of work being done, uh, so not here and, and not even overseas. So it, it's also an area where Australia could take a lead if it's if it so chose. So I think, uh, oh, so then there's one more slide. Uh, so what what does what's uh, what role can a robot robot robotic uh, robotics roadmap play in transport and autonomy, uh, transport and mobility in Australia? So you know, robotics are important, just and automated vehicles are important, but even more important, I think, is the is work on um, developing and deploying AI to the many, many decision-making processes that occur in the mobility system. Uh, I mean, it, to some degree, it's happening anyway, but nonetheless, it's the AI applied to decision-making in lots and lots of places that is um, going to take, the, take transport and mobility forward more than just automated vehicles. So, so to my second point, you know, so is it the vehicle or the system? Well. Yes, we do need to work on the vehicle, um, but more more urgently, we need to work on the the um, uh, hosting system so that it can um, interact most constructively with the vehicle and extract the maximum benefit from high levels of vehicle usage. Um, we the shortest path to impact is so how, how do we actually get going on this, um, and and that re, that goes to the the discussion that uh, Paul was sharing with us uh, earlier. Um, my my contention is that we need to focus on on uh, uh, evaluating use cases, and I, I'm particularly disappointed that uh, Paul was unable to get the Caratha initiative up. I think that would have been fabulous. I <laughs> I agree that the that shuttle shuttle buses are a pretty um, uh, modest. Uh, uh, endeavour, and I think we need to to sort of find what's the what are the next more the, the more challenging but possible applications of vehicle automation that we can stand up in Australia, um, so that we can uh, it, it, it demonstrate the benefits that they can deliver. Uh, we you know there have been uh, discussions. Pr prior to this about, you know, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could stand up a, um, a, a, a an Australian automated vehicle company? Uh, yes, it would, but is that likely to happen? I'm, I'm fairly sceptical. So uh, I would contend that Australia's uh, role in, in the vehicle automation space is probably best directed at implementation to, again, to quote Paul, I mean, we've been doing this in, in our mining community for, for years and years, and we're, we're world leaders in, or yes, our minds are world leading in that respect. Uh, we're engaged with the world leading um, uh, uh, equipment vendors in that space. So uh, I, I would challenge us to sort of learn from that and try to find other dimensions of Australian uh, business operations where we can um, similarly deploy those deployed vehicles like this. And, 
whether that's university campuses or whether it's airports or whether it's mines or whether um, or whether it's ports, who knows? Uh, you know, we need to look for wherever it's possible to do. And 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 finally, to so what's the largest challenge? It's actually, uh, uh, I think it's community acceptance of change, um, <laughs> and whether that's uh, 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 change in 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 you know changing away from SCATs as our our intersection management tool, or whether it's changing our expectation that automated vehicles will be perfect, or whether it's changing our idea of uh, the the the, the the, va the values that uh, automated vehicles can contribute, uh, I don't know, but change is, is the essential problem or the essential requirement and it's the essential problem that we have to address. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. And we are at time. We haven't done the Miro activity associated with Ian's presentation, but people have already started putting notes up. Uh, we won't go to questions now because we'll try and finish right on time. However, the Miro board will remain open. So if you haven't had an opportunity to uh, contribute, please uh, take your time and actually put some notes up and reflect and then come back again another day. Uh, we would welcome your comments. I'd like to thank all of my co-chairs today. Uh, thank our Miro master, Andrew Scott from Queensland Robotics Cluster. Uh, Michael Milford from QUT. Uh, unfortunately, Brett Dale was unable to be here, but he certainly contributed in all of the lead up to this. Uh, so we're thinking of you, Brett. Uh, Zoe Ether from My Smart Community, thank you. Paul Lucy from Project 412. And Ian Christensen from iMove CRC. Thank you all for your contributions and thank you very much to our audience. And yes, please continue to contribute. Uh, the mirror board will remain open and we will send you um, a link to the recording of this event and welcome any further contributions. Okay, thank you very much.